Sup fellow nerds, it's good to see you. Sorry about this video being a little bit later than I said it would be. And also, welcome to a bit of a change of scenery to what you've been used to on this channel. This is where, as they say, the magic happens. So, series 13 has come and gone, and as I've said on multiple occasions, this has been the most polarizing series of Doctor Who to date. This, the final full series fronted by Chris Chibnall with Jodie Whittaker in the title role, was greatly affected by the pandemic. It started out as 10 episodes, like we knew from this era, then got cut down to 8, and then again down to 6. You would assume that since Chib has decided to make the series one long story, it would be a surefire way to tell a cohesive narrative in its entirety, with loads of breathing room leaving no stone unturned. But what did we get? A bloated story full of holes, questions, and unturned stones. Not to say I'm surprised, to be honest. A running thing of this era was Chris introducing loads and loads of stuff to supposedly make everything feel a bit more meaty, but there's not much meat in these gym mats. Plus one nerd point if you know that one. Unfired guns is how I put it before, and while we do have three specials to go, the first of which we focused on Daleks and nothing but, I'd assume. Okay, so we've got two specials to go to see if any of these unfired guns get fired. Those are things I'll get into in my big questions video, which I'm going to do next week. But let's have a look at series 13, or Flux, as a whole. How I summed up my thoughts on chapter 6 in my review of chapter 6 basically sums up my thoughts for the entire series, and that is that I'm disappointed. As said, this felt like the easiest way for Chris to not cock things up. Six episodes to tell one story. That is five solid hours of screen time. Many had finished series 12 with a rather bitter taste in their mouths, and since Revolution of the Daleks focused on Daleks and nothing much else, we were looking towards series 13 for more exploration, answers, and funnily enough, exposition on what the hell happened in the Timeless Children. The plot of Flux was built around the elusive division, a religion, a society, a movement, a whatever you want to call it, that stemmed from Gallifreyan civilization, which in itself basically changed in its entirety almost two years ago now. But the reality of the Flux event, how I see it, is that it quite literally came out of nowhere. People were looking at characters introduced in this series and, as they always do, predict them to be a new master or Rani or Valyard or something. Perhaps this became omnipresent across social media for Flux because people wanted there to be a narrative grounding for what the fuck was going on, but rooted in who that we already knew. Something to not make this whole thing be a pure Chibnall creation or a, I don't know, a chiblet, as we'll refer to them from here on in, because when it's a chiblet, it's not going to be good. Conversely, similar to how we treated the Daleks and the Cybermen in series prior, returning monsters he did an excellent justice. I have got a video planned about resolution, and the haunting of Validiadati and Ascension of the Cybermen in last series were absolute bangers, so it's no surprise that he managed to do it again. The Weeping Angels were brought back and were made not shit. Thank you more to Maxine Alderton on that, but also credit to Chris for restraining himself on getting his grubby little protuberances on them. But the real winners of Series 13 were the Sontarans. The potential threat of a baked potato bellend was almost entirely mashed across the Moffat era, as viewers couldn't take them seriously anymore since Strax was given a supporting comic relief role. Props to Chris for making them dangerous again, and there were jokes included in their screen time. It's Doctor Who, after all, it doesn't take itself overly seriously all the time, but in the grand scheme of things, they were brought back, and he made them scary again. So again, props to you for managing that. As for a villain, or in this case, pair of villains who didn't get their due diligence, let's talk about Swarm and Azure. Swarm was the main word that Chibnall teased in the build-up to Chapter 1, and while they were the big personified bad of the series, by the end of the series, they felt almost entirely hollow. Sam Spruill and Roshanda Sandal were absolutely magnificent in their performances. I genuinely loved every second they were on screen, but they were massively let down by the fact that their backstory, motives, and potential demise were just so bland. A chiblet worth keeping and maybe re-exploring in the future if they get the chance, because their past with the Doctor and Division felt almost entirely unrealized. Segwaying nicely into Division, I said this last week on my Chapter 6 review, they were created as a threat, and that's all they are. No meat on their bones, just a threat that's apparently been here the entire time, and it's rooted in Gallifreyan civilization, but at least the bit of Gallifreyan civilization that we only knew post-2020. We were supposed to just accept and appreciate it like we knew and cared the whole time. It's like how Marvel did five films introducing all the characters, then the Avengers so people gave a shit about them as a whole, whereas DC did three films, then did Justice League with barely any introduction to the other half of the team. Division feels like the latter here, but over even less time, as in zero films and just straight in with the big one. 
I was intrigued about Division when it was first mentioned back in the Timeless Children, but as soon as Tek Taehyung went on a vague spiel about who they actually were, I immediately lost interest. Simple, yet indescribable. I think I could genuinely hear Chris Chibnall's pen and or keyboard screaming at this point, THERE'S NOTHING HERE! I'M A FACADE HIDING FUCK ALL! I think there was a grander plan to this series and fleshing out these main villains, but COVID taking chunks of the screen time away didn't help, and instead of dropping overarching story beats to make the narrative load lighter but still whole, Chibs instead punched his arm into the side, shoulder deep, and pulled out the meat from the middle, causing the structure to collapse from the inside. If you boiled the whole series down in a quick Wikipedia synopsis, it would sound pretty cool, but when you wanted to read into the lore of it, you'd open the book and find… all the pages are blank. The final big bad, the Grand Serpent, we don't really know all that much about him. But I think he was included solely to give Vinda a personal vendetta that is in reality barely realised. If he'd have killed off a character, we might have rightly disliked him more, and while it wasn't Kate Stewart, thank god, why not Belle? Not to say that I wanted Belle to be killed off, that's very much not the case, but it would have been ruthless and astonishingly harsh, and it would have ticked off Vinda more than just seeing a dirty deal be done when on duty. Big whoop. Okay, let's talk companions, and I've seen many people say this on the old socials, and I've gotta say I agree. This could have been a companion light or companion lus series. Chibnall has fluffed every companion in his tenure, and as much as we were hoping for more from Yaz and you've gotta love John Bishop, they weren't necessary. The quote-unquote backstory of our main villains all revolved around the Doctor, and Yaz and Dan were just along for the ride. And yes, if you boil down the companion role in Doctor Who, that's really all they are, but in this series they were basically entirely useless. Perhaps Yaz could have decided to step away for a bit after Revolution like Graham and Ryan did, then come back for the final special like Graham and Ryan are. Spoilers? It's kind of obvious that would be the case, I guess. I'm not going to lose sleep over the companions being sidelined as we're very much used to it by now, but as said, we wanted more from Yaz and Dan. On the flip side, however, the guest characters that introduced this series were all pretty damn great. Bar one. Claire had an interesting relevance, Jericho was wonderful to watch, may he rest in peace, and Vinda and Belle really didn't feel all that tacked on by the end. They were part of the team by chapter 6, and like I mentioned before, I enjoyed how their story playing out from chapter 3 onwards gave us more context to how much the Flux was screwing with the wider universe. Plus, they weren't the Doctor's parents. Yet. Maybe. Yet. Carvanista, strange visage aside, was a nice concept, a race of doggos bound to a human. Man's best friend, but it's being seen from a very snide and cynical point of view from Carvanista. That was awesome. Though, I would have rather that he kicked the bucket instead of Jericho. Nothing against him, but I feel like if they were going for a big emotional dick punch, and not to say that Jericho didn't punch me in the pee-pee just a little bit, but if, for example, Carvanista died in Dan's arms and finally, you know, said something nice to him, maybe that would have landed a bit more so than Jericho being fluxed all by himself. And Kate Stewart was completely wasted. Well done, Chris. Nothing more to be said on that one. That sucked. Don't do that again. So, the titular Doctor. Was this her best series as a whole? Perhaps? There have been some pretty brilliant moments for her, such as War of the Sontarans' classroom scene, rescuing herself in the Vanquishers was pretty fun, and seeing her up against Ruth is always a delight. Though we did have typical overuse of the sonic screwdriver and her exposition delivery wasn't all that great, although, as I've said before, it is a hill I am still on, that's not entirely Jodie's fault. And if you listen to Escaping Costebrous, the podcast I do with my fiance Amy, in the Shakespeare Code I pick apart an exposition scene and why it worked then and not so much now in the Chibnall era, so go and listen to that. If Chibs manages to nail the Doctor in these last few specials, not like that, it'll unfortunately feel too late. We've got, what, about three hours left with 13 now overall? I'll probably dig more into her character as a whole come my eventual, you know, era review of the Chibnall era at the end of next year, but I'm still very much in the mindset of I really, really like Jodie, but she's been given not great material to work with. She has glimmers of absolute brilliance, but in the grand scheme of things, all she's reading is beige. Let's talk episodes on the whole then. Look, here's a little graph I've put together that shows you my scores across the series, and as you can see, it kind of on average irks downwards as the series progresses. The standout episode, War of the Sontarans. Excellent pace, excellent narrative, excellent characters, it felt like the new Who we know and love. The worst, obviously, Once Upon Time. A ton of fluff that, in the grand scheme of things, felt completely irrelevant. 
If you're only just stumbling across this Series 13 review, hello, welcome to my channel and want to see more of my opinions in depth on these episodes, then head to my channel and look at the Series 13 Flux playlist. And why not hit subscribe while you're there? It'll mean a lot. So there are elements of episodes that were great, but tons of stuff, either mediocre or bad, going on around it. Chapter 1 was overfilled with at least relevant narrative, while Chapter 3, as said, was mostly just filler. If Chibnall made flashcards, for example, of all the main big talking points across the course of the series and split them up chapter by chapter, you could very much see how much weight there was on chapter 1 and then not so much on chapter 3 and then maybe a bit more in chapters 4 and 5, not 4 and 5, 5 and 6. Eh, maybe he could have reordered things and made it all a bit more easily digestible over the course of the series. It's like a slap-up three-course meal for chapter one, then a cold chicken Kiev with next to bugger all sauce in it for chapter three. Things weren't weighted correctly, and it made things overall feel disjointed and sometimes confusing to follow. So like I said, it was a disappointing series overall, though there was a lot of potential. But at the end of the day, it's still Chibnall at the helm. I think I put it best when I said it was like he Dolores umbraged himself into Doctor Who. He scarred his name into the flesh of the series. The Flux, Division, The Timeless Child, all of it will bear his name. Comparatively, The Time War was devised by Russell T Davies and it was a big deal, the biggest deal in the entire Hooniverse, but it was explored between him and Moffat, so it felt like more of a joint effort and makes it sink into the fabric of the universe's narrative more naturally than Division, The Timeless Child, and whatever happened with Swarm and Azure. Hollow Addendums. Hollow addendums we're just expected to go along with. Hollow addendums that don't feel like narratives bubbling to the surface that have their roots woven through the history of the show. They are just, they're just there. Created by someone who thinks he knows best for Doctor Who and doesn't care for those who might question it. Something added with so little flesh that we're just expected to perceive it as mysterious. There were the wilderness years in Who between 96 and 05, a time where we were supposed to wonder what happened, but this pre-Doctor time we're supposed to be fascinated with has been artificially flung upon us. We didn't need to know what happened before. Mystery is mystery but not having the grounding behind something so big in the grand scheme of things isn't mystery. It's bad writing. And I feel like I'm gonna do this speech again come my era review. I don't like preemptively making assumptions about episodes, but I go between series hoping that he might learn his lesson and change some things, but three series down, three specials to go, and alas. If I pitted against series 11 and series 12 and tried to put them in a ranking order, I honestly don't know. I really don't. There are some gem moments and brilliant stories in those series, but that is still surrounded with a murky grey. So, yeah. Disappointing. Not to say I'm surprised in the grand scheme of things, but I did hope that telling one story would give him a crap load of wiggle room, but he filled that wiggle room with crap. See you on January 1st, Chris. But what did you think of Series 13, or Doctor Who Flux, as a whole? Be honest, but be civil. Let me know in the comments section below. Stay tuned for one more video for Series 13 before we look to the new year and Eve of the Daleks, which I will not lie, I am excited for. Love me some Daleks! as you know. Check out the Escaping Castebras podcast if you like your podcasts, and if you haven't already, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel content is on the way, as I've just said. But otherwise, thank you all so much for watching. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.